Hi, my name's Bob Grunier and I'm a volunteer with the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project. So, on the 26th of March 2023, I gave a presentation called O-Day Centred, and I will give another update soon on uh, some things that I need to expand upon in that. And in part, that's what I'm doing here today. I found a paper that was in the Electric Spacecraft Journal, issue 9 1993 and I reached out to the curators of the Charles A. Yost Research Library and Archive and asked them if I could gain access to that paper in a better form than I was able to see on the internet and if I would be able to remaster it and publish it. So uh, they came back to me very quickly and thank you very much to the curators of the Charles A. Yost Research Library and Archive for allowing me to do this. Uh, if you wish to go there and gain access to this um, in uh, paper form, uh, or rather email, uh, you can get a download as a PDF, I think, uh, at klibrary.com uh, or send an email there. Anyway, so um, this paper was called Anomalous Radioactive Variations, and it was by Joe Parr. And I'm not going to read through all of it. I just want to bring out some things. You can go and have a look at remoteview.icu and see the paper that I've remastered. But it is very, very interesting because it essentially supports the claims of one Alexander Parkamov. And if you recall, in Space, Earth, Human, uh, Part of that book talks about his research where he looked at isotopes of cobalt-60 and potassium, which contains 40 potassium, which is 0.12% of all natural potassium. And these are pure beta isotopes. And he also you, you looked at strontium-90 and uh, strontium-90, yttrium-90, and that also is a beta isotope. So here we got cobalt, 60 cobalt, uh, 90 strontium, and yttrium 90. And he looked over uh, more than one decade the decay rates across the annual cycle with a very special instrument uh, telescope that he devised. And he found that there was indeed a cycle that went across the year and uh, it was not the case for alpha particle uh, emitting isotopes like uh, 239 plutonium here and so the assumption is then that something was interacting with the beta isotope and changing the rate of its decay so there was a flux and effectively what he had was a telescope uh, and I have a picture of it uh, down here, this telescope here, and this focused the incident radiation from wherever it came from onto the radioactive sample, and there was a Geiger counter that read the rate of decay for that. So this is very, very interesting, and from this, he derived that there must be some form of radiation that allows for weak force interaction to stimulate the beta decay, inverse beta decay. And he found out it had to be inverse beta decay because he screened for lower energies. And so what you're seeing here is the variation in the higher energy that comes out. And that means it can only be inverse beta decay that is going on. And so... Um, this means that there is something coming from the cosmos and he concludes that it is effectively cold relic background type neutrinos. These are not the neutrinos that come from the nucleus of a nuclear reactor. They are left over from the birth of the universe or if you don't believe that there was a big bang, they come from the cyclical nature of stars dying and blowing up and and uh, these kind of cataclysmic events that occur in the universe. Anyway, so uh, it kind of stands on its own in making those uh, views. And I highly recommend 
you get a chance to investigate Dr. Alexander Parkamov's work. Anyway, that being said, when I was reading through this paper, it became very clear to me that effectively Joe Parr had discovered something similar or the same, and that he was uh, not <laughs> understanding what was causing it. He calls, called these things mass particles that were probably doing the work and that they get trapped in pyramids, uh, uh, the geometry of a pyramid. And he was, one of his observations was that he had observed an in, a, a change during the alignment um, between the center of the galaxy, the sun and the earth and the constellation of Orion. And in uh, Orion, uh, the big star there is Betelgeuse, which is over 700 times the mass of our sun. And in fact, that same star was able to be observed via the telescope of Alexander Parkamov by using this inverse beta decay process and it is gravitational lensing and I've talked about the work of Xu Wenzhu which supports this as well. So there's a gravitational component going on and of course relic neutrinos are neutrinos they are in they interact with the weak force and gravity and so it stands to reason that they would be gravitationally lensed in that way. So anyway going on uh, this uh, paper which I say you can read one thing that struck out with me is the fact that he actually developed a different transducer. Now, the interesting thing here is it was in 1978 in Antarctica Palmer Station, Operation Deep Freeze, where Mr. Parr developed a form of gamma ray transducer. Now, the interesting thing about that date, 1978, was in 1977, he was on top of the Giza Pyramid. So the following year, he goes to Antarctica, it would seem, on a military operation with a B-52 bomber apparently circling overhead the whole time he was there. And during his time there, develops this thing called a gamma ray transducer. So from a, another source, we'll, we'll read about what that is, but in brief, I've got it down here in the uh, uh, footnotes here. It's the mating of a one or so microcurie source say cesium-137 and a dosimeter of 200 millirontgen and you read it and reset it every 24 hours and you average over 20, uh, 10 days so that was his process and like Alexander Parkamov he did some long-term studies so he talks about being on the Cheops pyramid here so the form of the transducer is a dosimeter in combination with a radioisotope gamma ray source. The principle is such that a known gamma ray source in proximity to the dosimeter will cause it to discharge at a definite rate. This is representative measure of the quantity of radioactivity absorbed over time. In addition, a Geiger counter is placed near the gamma ray dosimeter transducer to measure its radioactive count. So Alexander Parkamov was using a Geiger counter with screening of the radioactive source so that you only got the high energy uh, uh, beta particles coming out. Okay, In this case, he is looking at gamma sources and also the Geiger counter, but also the, the uh, effect on a dosimeter. So you've got two like supporting pieces of data and he's chosen a gamma emitter but also it is a beta emitter as well the the cesium-137 now the actual sources that he used were very very interesting to me and I'll go into that in a little time but here it says the variation is noted to be often coincidental with moon phases solar activity and the earth's orbital location I believe that this is the same thing that Alexander Parkamov had established and here we have corroborating evidence from a third party. Actually, it would seem that T.T. Uh, uh, Brown in his lab notes had also observed something 
uh, interesting along these lines uh, previously. So the view of Mr. Parr was that the placement of a pyramid shape over a gamma dosimeter enhances the variation of the Geiger count with respect to planetary position effect. Right, now, we know from Alexander Parkhamov's uh, experiments that a dense material, in his case, uh, a millimeter or so thick uh, metal parabolic dish, is sufficient to reflect and, in this case, focus to the su uh, sample that is being impinged upon these flux from the natural environment. The thing is that if you read this paper down, he actually has, uh, in his early experiments, uh, the pyramid. Inside the pyramid, he has the radioactive source. And if we look at the work of Alexander Shishkin et al. for nine years at Dubna between 19, uh, 2009 and uh, 2018, they found that the uh, so-called birdies that they observed, these things here on x-ray film, could be produced by materials irradiated with gamma radiation and from sources 60 cobalt and 137 cesium. Now, why are they interesting? Well, they are both gamma sources. So, what he is saying is that, um, effectively, uh, he has got a pyramid which has got dense material over a gamma source, and a gamma source will produce these birdies. And this was corroborated, uh, so these, these are the birdies produced by Shishkin et al. And independently, I discussed... Uh, in my Azizi 2021 presentation, Lena in a Can, the work of Bogdanovich et al. at the Moscow Nuclear Physics Institute. And if you can see here, they have a synchrotron that produces high energy electrons that go through a conversion target and produce gamma rays. And the gamma rays go through a magnet. And here is the paper here. It is uh, open science here, experimental study of env uh, environmental ionization in the zone of a periodic discharge in a f uh, flow of liquid. So these are extensions of their work, but they did corroborating evidence. They, so this is discharges in a uh, liquid. They observe these same structures. And they also did this synchrotron experiment High energy electrons, conversion target, produces gamma ray, get rid of the residual electrons, and then on a uh, X-ray uh, film, they observe these exactly the same birdies. So synthetically produced gamma and nuclear gamma will produce these birdies. And as you can see here, where you are, have got one monopole type going one way and one monopole type going the other, they will aggregate. They will self-organize. So if you had a partially uh, reflecting material like a pyramid and it was uh, in, an, in, in an environment where you are producing these miniature monopoles, you effectively have a focusing array that allows for them to build up and build up. And these things, not only when they're formed, they can persist for quite a period of time. And if they're aggregating, again, they may be getting stronger. And they can cohere matter from the environment as well. So if you had micro monopoles that are according to Ken Shoulders, ubiquitous, and they come into the sphere of the self-clustered structure that is in the pyramid, then it would gain in strength. And if you were in celestial alignments, the stars had aligned, then you would have a denser flux of these things coming from the cosmos, and at those instances, you would get the most extreme events. So, it's not surprising to me that you would have moon phases and uh, uh, solar activity and uh, the celestial alignment playing a role. So, the experiment here, interestingly, 
has the gamma source on one side of the pyramid. Now, the, what, what, what he's got, actually, so if we actually look at it, he has two pyramids on either side, and on one of them he has this gamma source, okay? And then he has alternate um, uh, magnets, and then uh, Geiger counters, and then he has a, a, a coil for pickup and fast Fourier transform, uh, so on. You can go and read it. But anyway, the pyramids are going between magnets, okay? And what we read in the work of uh, Bogdanovich is that they assume that the monopoles, in their case, are bound to the magnets that they pass the gamma rays through, and that the gamma rays themselves remove these already formed clusters that are bound to the north and south pole of the magnets by a process akin to photoionization. And you can go and read that in this paper. Now, whether it is directly synthesizing them or knocking them off, you see, in, in this environment, yes, the gamma ray and the, the beta particle could do ionization. And ionization could lead to self-clustering. But having a magnet with them already on there, you can literally knock off the clusters. The work of Shishkin, however, is kind of, you know, as, as, it, as, as it says here, um, materials irradiated with gamma radiation and so forth. So, you know, um, I've spoken about the fact that John Hutchison had a uranite source. Uranium has a lot of transitions. You've got gamma and high energy, sorry, sorry, high energy transitions in there that are sufficient enough to do this same process. So essentially, I would argue that in here you are getting a lot of these things forming. Uh, there can be some focusing going on in the pyramid, and moreover, if the argument stands from Bogdanovich et al. from this. 2000 and I believe it is 17 paper I think 2017 uh, maybe some sometime around there um, uh, 2019 paper rather then uh, if it's knocking it off these poles then also you could imagine that uh, that was um, playing a role in producing these overall macro clusters now here is a view of you know a peripheral view, side view of the construction. And here are your two pyramids that you have on one side. It's got the gamma source uh, behind. And it goes between these four magnets that are uh, spaced so that the pyramids can fly in between them. And you've got these plus and minus poles, and they're very, very specifically organized so that as they go through, the center line of the pyramid is goes to the center line of the magnet and the base goes uh, through the center line of the magnet there and so um, what you can imagine is that as this is traveling around the structures that have formed inside here are oscillating they're oscillating because they you know the these um, structures are influenced by an electric field the the clusters that we're talking about uh, here um, and uh, in here to a certain degree um, or there is a bias with uh, uh, sorry a magnetic field rather uh, it, it seems to be influenced by that so if the, if it's switching this magnetic field around and also he was pouring a vast volume of uh, ions into the environment but not in the case of uh, the pyramid, straight pyramids, but in the larger device. He was producing 350,000 cc's per meter using an ion generator. So that's in the later experiments. But in the, the previous experiments where he just had the pyramid and the gamma dosimeter, uh, uh, as, as the gamma transducer, and uh, uh, so forth, uh, he didn't have those. But anyway, my, my point being is, that if you look at the conclusion of the book of Ken Shoulders, his E.V. A Tale of Discovery, 1987, he argues that the exotic vacuum object, which at that time he was calling electron validium, uh, strong electron, is effectively the equivalent of 
Zeldovich's 1956, 57, sometime in the 1950s, uh, description of an anapole, which is a non-radiating, not a non-electromagnetically radiating structure. It can be influenced by the scalar and vector potential, but non-electromagnetically radiating uh, uh, structure that is an oscillating monopole. Okay, so you can imagine that something similar might be formed in this overall structure here. Now, so so that that is this device, and then the other device with just the pyramids. Now, the early ones were the tests where he had the pyramids and and the uh, gamma transducer. He used one thirty seven cesium. We know that it produces these birdies okay and we know that the birdies will self-cluster and if they've got a mix you'll have a mix of self-clusters you've got the magnetic charges of the north type and magnetic charges of the south type and if they're both in a pyramid they're going to join forces together and then they're going to arrange themselves and in these experiments he arranged the pyramid north south so it was the same environment as you've got for the great pyramid of Giza He's also got 60 cobalt. So, again, as I'm saying, 60 cobalt and 137 cesium, they will produce these birdies. Okay? They will produce these birdies. If they are mixed type, they will arrange in one way. And if they are uh, a single type, they, they will arrange in another way. Okay, so the other interesting thing is he's got 133 barium. Why is that interesting to me? That is interesting to me because this does electron capture and then does a gamma ray. So these are all gamma ray sources. They will produce the birdies even if you really, 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 really don't want them to. Okay? They will produce these things. They will cluster. They will do the magic. Okay? The interesting thing is he used 133 barium. Something which Alexander Parkamov did not. As I said earlier, in Alexander Parkamov's work, he looked at potassium-40 in the form of natural potassium, uh, the 0.12% that is in natural potassium. He also looked at 60 cobalt, which all of these parties have looked at, and also strontium-90, yttrium-90. These are all beta isotopes, potassium-40, 60 cobalt, strontium-90, yttrium-90, okay? But this is able to produce, uh, the ones that he used, gamma rays, uh, th sorry, that, uh, that uh, Joe Parr used, the, even the barium-133 uh, produces a gamma ray in its electron after its electron capture and it goes to uh, cesium-133 the stable isotope of cesium so in Parkamov's work he demonstrated that an alpha decay is not affected by this process hence he concluded this must be something similar to uh, a neutrino and because of the scale and the fact that it can be reflected by dense material in the uh, uh, and, and also because he used a diffraction grating, which you can also see in the book, he found that these particles must be in the scale of microns to millimeters, and that de Broglie wavelength would imply extremely low energy. Okay, so that being said, and that's in this book, Space, uh, Space Earth, Human, he never tried, in, to the best of my knowledge, and I will verify this with him, an electron capture isotope. And 133 barium supports the theory that is effectively encoded in our Parkamov MFMP Philip Power programmed uh, uh, calculator, which you can get at nanosoft.co.nz. Uh, so you can do your uh, reactions here. And uh, when it comes up, you've got, let's say, fusion reactions here. If I zoom into this, okay, we have neutrinos coming in on the left and neutrinos coming on in on the right and so uh, Parkamov, uh, Alex, Dr. Alexander Parkamov to the best of my knowledge did not test that but this work by Joe Parr in my view verifies the findings of Alexander Parkamov 
and we have a consistent data set between all of these different nuclear scientists and so forth. So uh, it also gives us another tool by which we can measure the rate of this process occurring using this uh, uh, gamma transducer. Okay, so you can go and read the other article, the rest of the article, but here we see a similar kind of cycles going on here. And this is uh, across a year and a half or thereabouts. Okay, he's using cesium-137 in this pyramid. And then in this pyramid, he's got barium-133, as I said. This has this electron capture, then the gamma emission. Again, sort of correlated between the cycles of the Earth and not so convincing. We've got a full moon down here and we've got a new moon here. Okay, here we've got a full moon. There's a... a a new moon here and a new moon here okay and then down here with the cobalt 60 we've got the new moon here we've got the full moon over here and so forth so um i believe that this work of joe parr for me the most important thing to get out of what i'm telling you right now is that this verifies and corroborates the work of alexander parkmov in space earth human and the great thing is that whilst Parkmob proved this is a neutrino, relic neutrino, cold neutrino, background neutrino, not the type that comes from the nuclear decay, okay? Not that type of neutrino. Very, very different. As different as gamma ray is to thermal photons, okay? IR. Very, very different properties. Not those. The relic neutrino, cold neutrino, background neutrino uh, is, in my view, proven by this and it is corroborated and the um the neutrino coming on on the other side the act like effectively like an anti-neutrino inverse decay is shown by the fact that joe parr did the barium 133 experiment so this is wonderful totally complementary in line and it supports also the work of Xu Wenju, which I have discussed in the past. And so I have to thank the, uh, again, Charles, the curators of the Charles A. Yost Research Library and Archive uh, for this document, which we work from the Electric Space Craft Journal, issue 9, 1993. And, uh, and the interesting thing is that, that effectively, whilst this was only published in 1993, it was independently uh, finding the same thing as Alexander Parkamov was doing in the late 1980s and early 1990s. So uh, that is about what I wanted to say uh, for that today. Um, the, the other thing is that uh, he in the pyramid here, uh, sorry, in the uh, spinning one here, um, it has... Uh, the ion injector going into this closed environment and we know that the uh, ions can uh, play a role because that they, they are he's saying electrons are going in there spraying electrons in there those are spin particles and they will interact with the clusters that are formed uh, from uh, these uh, other processes the the clusters that have formed from um these gamma rays and their interaction with the environment and dense matter so i think that's is that all i wanted to say uh the other the other thing is i'm going to do a calculation uh based on the distance of this rod which is apparently 25 inches and the fact that they are two inch cubes at the end there i'm going to do a calculation on that so look out for that i've got a correction to make on my presentation on sunday so uh look out for the next video so thank you very much for your time and i will see you in that next video